Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman. Welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with Philip Tessier, a world-renowned, award-winning chef, author, coach, culinary partner, and innovator. He was the first American chef to ever place on the podium at the Bacus d'Or competition in France. He took home the silver medal in 2015 and led the U.S. team to gold in 2017. He recounts his journey in his book, Chasing Bocuse. Today, Chef Tessier is the executive chef and partner of Press in St. Helena, where he is redefining dining experiences in the Napa Valley. Join us today as we chat with Chef Tessier about competing at the highest culinary level, working in some of the most prestigious restaurants in the world, and the value of mentorship and giving back. Welcome, Chef. Good morning. There he is. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's great to have you. A little early on the West Coast, right? Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. You know, before anything, I, you know, how are you? Is the family healthy? The, the staff healthy? Managing the, the pandemic well um, as, we, as we're, we're all trying to? Yeah, I think we're hopefully on the downslope from this, uh, this craziness, you know. Um, yeah, it's been a long time. Have been interesting both between business and, you know, keeping the staff as, as safe as we can, keeping them confident, you know, we're doing the right thing for them. So uh feels like hopefully, uh, I know we've said it before, hopefully the worst is behind us. But, you know. Yeah, we certainly hope so. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's great to see restaurants opening again. And uh, for sure. we know our students are eager for that as well. But, uh, hey, you know, to kick things off today, Chef, I, at first I have to say it'd be remiss if I didn't say congratulations. What, what a career. It's, there's a lot to see about what you've done in the, in the last couple of decades. And, and I know we'll talk much about Bukus today, but, uh, you know, I, I have to f- focus on you first. i um, going to embarrass you a little bit. Um, Chasing Bukus, what an absolutely beautiful book. It's a Thank coffee you. table book. It's a, it's a worker book, right? It's all over the place. I have it here at the school. Um, you're a chef, you're an entrepreneur, you're an author, you're a mentor. And, it, and it's important, I believe, to recognize and mention as I listen to, to your stories of your journey, um, what really touched me is how you share your success with, with everyone on your team. You speak so highly of your team. You speak so highly of those you mentor. You speak so highly of the restaurant industry itself. You mention that there's no better time to be a chef. Just really, really exciting. And, you know, I wanted to, to say thank you for those thoughts. Really, really important at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and two things, just to kick things off today that you mentioned um, are necessary in a great recipe. Number one, quality ingredients. And number two, great technique. So shamelessly, I'd, I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit, particularly for our student audience. Techniques and, and, and ingredients. Sure, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, that comes kind of directly from, from the Thomas Keller, you know, school of thought. Um, and, you know, I think really it's, uh, you know, I moved out to California in, in 2007. And I remember I did some small interview for LA Times and I remember saying in there that, you know, everybody uses the same care. It's really the technique that matters. And, and, you know, after being in California for two years, you know, soon regret <laughs> that statement. <laughs> Let me take that back. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's, it's really the difference between at least what New York was at that time. And, um, you know, everyone's ordering from the same produce companies, like, you know, you have the union square market and such during certain seasons, but, you know, a lot of it is, is, is more limited in terms of what you get your hands on. And, um, you know, I think being out in California, especially, you know, over the last, you know, 11, 12 years, you know, it's really shown me kind of, you know, several things. One is the direct connection to those ingredients as a real uh, influence, not only in, in, in how we cook and how we think, but, you know, in, in just our appreciation for and, and excitement for things, you know, when you see crones come out of the ground for the first time and you realize that. <laughs> that's how they grow. And, and when you see, you know, maybe a, a pea shoot growing at a different stage than you would have, because the produce company only delivers it a certain way. Like it just expands kind of your understanding of, of one ingredient. And so, you know, the, the quality of that ingredient coming to you, uh, both in terms of its actual quality and freshness, but also, you know, what stage of life it's in and, and things like this. Um, 
you know, is really is really your starting point. I think technique can cover over a lot of flaws, um, but when it's not used in this way, when it's really just used to add value to something that's already, you know, uh, um, something that garners your attention on its own, like it really kind of just gives you the opportunity to to hit new levels. And so, you know, those are those are the two I would call you know basic ingredients, uh, if you will, um, for really anything that that you know we want to do in 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 our craft and um, i think it what's really separates you know the uh the, the 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 stages of restaurants that you you see from the from the bottom up you know if there's i would say there's zero restaurants at the top that are using inferior products or or flawed techniques so um it kind of speaks for itself Great, great, great advice. I, I love the the use of the term craft because that's definitely what it is. Mm -hmm. So, so, so here, here, here comes some of the um, the accolades, right? So, there's no other chef in the world that can say I'm a Bocuse d'Or silver medalist and gold medalist in the same sentence, but you can, and and um, you know, along with that, you've achieved you know such prestige and and, and more pres prestige than a chef could hope for. So I'd, I'd love for you to set the stage a little bit. I think it would be cool in your words to hear a little bit more about Bakus and the competition, but more than anything, it, you, you, you're, you're on the competition floor or on the stage, the envelope is being opened and United States is announced for the silver medal. What, what is going through your mind at that time? What isn't going through yeah, your mind like, at that time? It's it's, uh, it's really hard to put into words. Um, I think you know when you when you think about everything that goes into a specific moment. You know, um, I think it specifically at at that moment, everything that was going through through my head was just you know a replaying of of every challenge, adversity, you know disappointment, success, and 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 really just the whole journey of getting there. And, you know, I think in 2015, you know, we went there as like total underdogs, like nobody paid attention to us. And, um, you know, having been involved in competition now for, you know, better part of a decade, you, you realize very quickly that there's, you know, three, four, maybe five teams that everybody's kind of really paying attention to. And, uh, you know, the beginning of, of that day, we were, we were not one of them. <laughs> uh, France was surrounded by a million cameras. And, you know, for us, you know, we, we just felt like we were there, you know, our little team standing around my box that day in the kitchen. And so, um, you know, as the day progressed, that changed pretty quickly and people started to realize like we, we had come with, with something quite different. And so, you know, when the day came for the awards and, and that moment, I think there was a, a strong sense of confidence that that we had done something, you know, worthy of recognition and, and yet still nothing certain until it was there. So, you know, at, at that point, you know, we were just focused on getting on the podium, you know, in, in almost 30 years, we, we never gotten better than sixth. And so, um, you know, ironically, it was Grant Ackett who announced that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, that envelope. And, you know, there was, I think more than anything, there was just a sense of, of release. <laughs> I think uh, I write about it a little in the book, but just you don't realize the weight that's on your shoulders until until you allow yourself to think about it. And I think for for so many months and really the whole year, just really trying to push aside the pressure, just focus on, on the task at hand. And so when you're finally able to kind of let your guard down and, and, you know, accept, you know, what we had achieved, it was, it was pretty extraordinary, just a, a flood of emotion. And then, you know, to be there with Chef Keller and Gavin Kaysen, who was the coach that year, and Skyler, who had uh, matured dramatically as a young 21 year old, um, you know, it was pretty, was pretty, pretty much even to this day, like when you recount it, you, all the same emotions are, are still there. And, you know, it's one of those things I think that's really hard to translate to, to young chefs, you know, is, is that, you know, that, that level of commitment, you know, just reaches such a, an extraordinarily different level of reward. And um, it's hard to, it, I think it's one of my passions is to, is to really tell this Boku story in, 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 in a more tangible way that gets people just excited about it. I think there's a, a strong level of intimidation and, and to some degree, Right. Oh, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. But at the same time, there's a lot of confidence and a lot of my confidence came from looking at who I was surrounded by. You know, I mean, I looked at the team of coaches with Grant Ackett and Dave Barron and Thomas Geller and, you know, uh, Daniel Balloon, 
Gab, uh, Gabriel Croy there and, and others and, and, you know, Richard Rosendale who had just competed in multiple times. And so, you know, it was like, well, you know, if, if I can't do it with these guys, like, you know, who, how are we going to do it? You know? And so, um, yeah, I think it, it's just, uh, it, it's such an extraordinary thing. And, and to be there in that stadium, I mean, it's, it's 2,500 fans. It's, it's everything, the, the, the tempo, the pace, the excitement, the intensity is, is second to none. So, um, you know, I've never considered myself a competition chef, but, uh, you know, I think when you're, when you're put into, you know, that this environment, you know, really pushes you to your limits. And I mean, to this day, I, I, I still look back at like, how do I get back to that level? How do I get back to that, that level of, you know, just intensity and focus and, and, you know, it's, it's something that pushes you to, to your limits and in a really good way. It's amazing the chills I get just hearing you, um, you know, share that story again. And, and I can remember, you know, trying to find the results way back then on the internet yeah. and everybody was so excited. And I, I rewatched some of the, you know, the footage again, this, this, this weekend, and it's hard not to get emotional. It's like a sporting event. You know, people have painted faces and flags and signs and uh, it, is it really, is it a lot different in Europe than it is in, in, in America when it comes to that type of that, that level of culinary cooking competition? Yeah, I think, I think there's two things there. I think one, you know, when you feel the emotions and everything there, I think the one that, that is probably missing the most when people watch this, because if you're here, you're just, you know, maybe it's just entertainment, maybe it's just, you know, curiosity, but really, you know, there's a, there's the whole thing running through the vein of, of the entire competition is just the intensity of the, of the patriotism you know, that you feel. And, you know, I was there in 2013 and when we took seventh, it's just that, that feeling of disappointment and and like your country, you know, and so being able to represent your country there is just, just extraordinary, you know, and and the honor that, 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 that was specifically and, you know, tying into your question of, of how it's perceived, you know, in Europe, um, it's different in each country, but I think what I've seen specifically is that like certain countries view this as a, as a, as a stake in the ground of their culinary recognition, their culinary importance and the importance of their, of their national heritage. So if you think about all of the Scandinavian countries, this, this is huge, you know, huge over there. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Think about France. It's, it's incredibly significant to them. And, you know, I was just there at the last you're at the last finals and, you know, um, Emmanuel Macron is there, you know, at this big grand chef's dinner. And, um, you know, he's, he's talking to everyone in the room, you know, mostly all the French chefs who are like, you know, our culinary heritage is a key part of, of, of us as, as France, you know? And so, you know, they just have a huge commitment now. I think it's like $4 million investment into the, the new team and new training center and all of this. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty, fascinating how you know that culinary heritage is such an important part of their culture you know as you as you see the world growing smaller and smaller and as you see english taking over in 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 many countries as the main language euro you know people are really looking to what do they what can they grab on to to preserve their culture and their heritage and so cuisine of course in france especially is such a key part of that so it's um it's something that i think when you, you referred earlier, just using the word craft, I think it's something that is pa- a passion of mine, you know, through this competition, through what I do as a chef on a daily basis is, is how do we elevate our craft to a level where people view this in our country the same way, you know, and it's, uh, it's, it's been boosted by certain things, also been challenged by some of those same things. So, you know, it's, a, it's, part, of, it's part of the journey and our, our responsibility. No, no. Well said. Well said. Um, a little bit more about the the actual competition. So it's been around for a, a, about 30 years, maybe a little bit more, right? Every maybe two years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, so it's held every two years and, and there's 24 finalists that come together. Um, 12 cook on the first day, 12 teams cook on the second day, uh, named after Paul Bacuse himself. And I mean, in your mind, is there anything <laughs> that even comes close to that? I know we have the culinary Olympics every four years and in, mm-hmm. in Germany is, 
is it this is it similar or is it different and it seems like a lot more pressure for one individual and your co um mm-hmm. in that box as you as you call it in in, yeah. in front of a lot of people versus a team right um can you speak a little bit to that so that people understand the significance of this competition yeah i think i think the interesting thing about Boku store versus, you know, any other competition that I know is, 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 is it's just two guys, you know, it's one chef and what they call me and they have to be 22 or younger. Most people don't know that. So, you know, there's, there's generally at least a 10 year age gap between the chef. Oof, yeah, yeah. You know, is, uh, is entertaining and challenging at the same time. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think the difference between, let's say the IKA Olympics in Germany is, you know, you, you see these guys come back from those and like, oh, we won eight gold medals, and three silver medals, and two bronze. And you're like, how many events are there over there? <laughs> Whereas Boku Store is, you know, it's, it's one day, you know, you get one shot at it, it's five and a half hours, you put up two dishes, you know, one is generally a plated item and the other one's on the sort of grandiose platter that you, that you have to design. And so, um, you know, I think the pressure of that is that, you know, if I don't do well in one event in the Olympics, I can go and do another one and we can, sure. yeah. and you know, yeah, everybody wants to win the overall, you know, thing, but for this, there's, there's three guys standing on that podium or, or girls and, and they, you know, that's it. So, you know, nobody, nobody wants to miss out on, on that. I mean, everybody, this is always a thing that I, I kind of come back to is kind of, you know, sense of gratitude on my, on my side. It's just, you know, watching other teams, other chefs put in, you know, the same effort and, you know, there's no guarantee. So, you know, for us to come away twice from that competition with the success that we did, it was, it was pretty extraordinary and, and something that we, we, we certainly don't take for granted, but yeah, I think, I think we used to joke about it in our training, you know, it was kind of one way that we found to just alleviate the pressure was just instead of like, you know, the, the secret thoughts of like, we only get one shot of this. What if we screw it up? You know, just joking, like, you know, Hey chef, you know, you only get one shot at this. Are you going to do it? Right. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you have to kind of just, it, you know, focus on what you can control, do everything you can to build your confidence for that day. And, and then, you know, I mean, honestly, that day when we went in, we were, we were just excited to, to show the world what we had, what we had done and, you know, who knows what was going to happen after that. So yeah, that just incredible story from from your um, from your website. You have this beautiful tribute to 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 Chef Paul Bacus. Um, I just want to share a little bit of it. And I quote every generation. There are chefs who break the mold, chefs who are pioneers and forge a new path in cuisine, become icons to the generation of chefs that follow them. They are idolized, emulated and achieve a legendary status among the mere mortals of the culinary world. We've heard the names Karem, Escoffier, thank you for that. And of course, Paul Bucuz. Um, can you speak a little bit to what the man actually meant to you? Yeah, I think anybody that you come across involved in the Boku store, you know, has a has a significant reverence for Paul Bocuse. And I think, um, you know, one of the key things was just being in France. You know, we have this the thing that first brought me there to the Boku store specifically was this, what they call the Dîner de Grand Chef. And it's uh, held on the first night of the competition. And it's, it's generally, uh, um, you know, there's about 200 chefs there, you know, so there's probably about 300 Michelin stars in one room, you know, at that point, it's pretty much the who's who of the, of the culinary world. And, and, you know, when you see the level of respect of those chefs towards Paul Boku, so I think that, that, that pretty much says it all when you when you look at Alain Ducasse and you know Joel Rouchon and all these others you know looking at him is really you know maybe there are other ta- more talented chefs or more exciting chefs or other things but what what Paul Bocos really did for for all of us you know those listening to this those who are students in the school today whether they recognize it or not is is you know really moved our craft and profession to being you know recognized as more of a a white a white collar profession i think you know the the pandemic we've experienced over the last two years has really kind of shown a, a clear dichotomy between you know sort of this blue collar perception of our industry and as well as you know the the high end side of it all where you know people are really trained professionals and 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 the impact that has and, and the demand people have for what, what we do and i think i think paul Bocuse was the first celebrity chef he was the first one to really kind of put us 
in the limelight out of the kitchen into in, into the into the spotlight a little bit and you know obviously that's been uh pushed in in some pretty far directions <laughs> mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. he was also a hard-working restaurateur who you know when you're in his restaurant seeing you know the staff that was surrounding him as i did you know multiple times um you know the reverence they have for him i mean he's like he's like the godfather you know and it's just amazing yeah, yeah it, it's just fascinating and and something that i think is is um you know well deserved with what he was able to to achieve and so i think for us you know i look at the opportunity the boku store has given me you know the you know the the, the doors that's opened in, in my career and path and you know i mean he's the one who created that opportunity for for myself and others so um, yeah, I think a lot of what we do, what I do today is really with that in mind towards, you know, that own same responsibility to those who work for me and, you know, what the choices I make for how, you know, we continue to grow in the future. Yeah, that's a beautiful tribute. Um, on, a, on a personal note, I grew up in a pastry chef's home uh, kitchen. You know, my father came over from Germany in 1960 and he made his what's called a Meister brief there. Um, and he has just this unbelievable respect for the craft. That's, that's what I learned growing up, just the respect for the ingredients and, and the hard work. And um, he wasn't a competition chef. And you said earlier, um, you, you, you made a comment about being a competition chef, that you're not a competition chef, and that chefs shouldn't compete for the sake of competing. Um, so it's it's clearly deeper for you is so maybe you can talk to that a little bit what 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 does that stage do for you and what does it mean to you it's beyond competing it sounds like i think the i mean the galvanizing moment for me to you know really decide i was going to do the boku store was was in 2013 you know we we had dinner at paul bocus i think the next day and you know, they, they engrave in front of Paul Bocuse's restaurant and there's an entryway with, you know, the avenue of winners and it's all the past Boku store winners there. And, uh, you know, you can see the empty spot where 2015, you know, was, was going to be. And I just remember standing there thinking, you know, like we have the best American chefs in our country are as good, if not better than anyone who won that day before. And so just, just kind of was a moment where it was like, it, you know, you just see it like, how great would it be to have USA, you know, in this, in this list of names in this list of countries. And so, you know, for me, for me, that's really what it was all about, you know, from, from day one. Um, and, and I think that's where, you know, when you look at um, why people compete, you know, I had, I had someone come and, you know, want to stage with me and they were like, I want to do the San Pellegrino competition. And like, I'm like, why do you want to do this? And he's like, well, you know, I got two more years to train for it. And, you know, I want to be, you know, like an influencer and I'm like, wait a minute, what, <laughs> you know? And, and I think this is where like, there's just a lot of, I remember coming back on the plane from 2017 when we won gold and like watching like, like top chef just randomly was playing, you know, on the plane and it's just like, wow, like this, the show, like everybody loves the show and people watch it. And like, yet yeah, nobody knows about the Boku store. And, you know, there's plenty of reasons for that, but the reality of, of, of that, that genuineness of the craft and, and recognizing like, this is, we can entertain others. We do entertain others with what we do, but the, the, the passion and the drive for us has to be the experience has to be the guest experience, the hospitality. And, you know, when it comes all the way into competition world, there, there has to be a really strong answer for the, the why behind it, you know, um, I remember my uh, my 11 year old was like, Papa, you should do more competitions so we can earn more money. I'm like, I hate to break it to you, but they don't pay very well. <laughs> so, you know, I think, oh, that's I think great. The, the why behind it is really important. And, you know, there's a lot of chefs who just compete to compete, you know, and, um, you know, I think what you eventually see with that is the food becomes very siloed into this competition style. And it doesn't, to me, evoke a lot of a soul and, and, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, personally I get excited about. And so, um, that, that's why, you know, when people come to me, it's like, I want to do Boca store. I'm like, do you (laughs) (laughs) being honest with them about what that means? And I always point them in the same direction. You need, you need to go work for the best chefs and the best restaurants. Like, that's it. Like it, 
it's not about going to train to be a competitor. It's about training to be a great chef, you know, and if you're oh, well said, well said, you're yeah. able to come into that com- competition world, you know, it'll, it'll translate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, along those same lines, I'd, I'd love it if you could speak a little bit to how, um, to create or develop a winning team. I've heard you mention that a few times on a few broadcasts that I've viewed. Um, I think it's important for young culinarians to understand how important the concept of a team is, whether you're going, you know, to, to France to compete or you're opening, you know, Monday through Friday and the weekends to take care of your guests when they come to your, to your restaurant or your, to your, to your, to your cafe, whatever it is. Um, if you want to speak a little bit to the importance of, of a team and building a winning team, keyword winning. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, you know, starting off, like, you know, there's always three things that kind of drove my decisions as to my choices in my career. You know, one was, I always want to be learning, you know, and you know, the second one was in order to do that, I need to be, I need to be working for the best. Um, and, and then thirdly was to be, to be part of a team, you know, that I was excited to be a part of and, and so those were always the three things I looked for and asked myself, you know, was I, was I doing those, you know, where I was. Um, and there's a few points where, you know, you're always going to learn something where you are, but you know, the, it's kind of like working out, you know, if you keep doing the same exercises, eventually you, you sort of plateau a little bit. So, you know, challenging myself to get out of that, that comfort zone and, and to push yourself into the next thing. Um, but using the example of the restaurant I'm in now, you know, I took this over as a consultant um, here at Press in St. Helena in, in California. And, uh, you know, I was supposed to be here for four months and it was kind of a traditional steakhouse and things were in, uh, you know, some strong disrepair here. But, you know, between a series of events with another project kind of falling through, COVID coming on and everything, you know, really kind of be, you know, stayed, stayed here on as a partner and we're really transforming this restaurant. But uh, the importance of people and the team just just can't be understated. You know, when, when challenging moments come in, I mean, it's, I tell these guys every day, Saturday, you know, like if we pretend like Monday, Tuesday, no big deal. And then we try to turn it on on Saturday. There's, there's no way that you're going to perform at that level. And so, you know, I think helping, helping the team understand the vision and the why behind what we do is, is really step one. Um, you know, for me, I'm, I tell everyone as they go through the hiring process here that, you know, I'm, I'm super protective over who we bring in. Um, because it, it really only takes one one wrong person in a sense to begin to challenge the culture. Um, and and I think that was one of the biggest things I took from you know working for for Thomas Keller for for a decade was just you know that that culture was super strong. You know, when we opened per se sure. yeah. before it was it was clear why we were all there. We were all there to be the best and to and and to achieve the goals that 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 chef Keller had set out for us and for himself and, 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 and anything less than that wasn't going to be accepted both by, by them or by, or by us, you know, individually. And so, you know, having what I look for are people who are self-motivated, have their own goals, their own visions, because then I'm, I'm, I'm not interested in, in pushing the whole thing forward. I'm, I'm much more interested in having people, who want to follow along. And, you know, if you do that well enough, when, when the challenging times come, because, you know, as much as all of us can be seen as, you know, we've got it all together and like, you know, we can overcome anything. I mean, we, anybody who says otherwise is, is probably lying to you, but we all come to a point where, you know, we're challenged personally and individually, like we need something that's going to get us past the next point. And, you know, in my experience, that's always been the team. That's always been the people around me who are like, we can do this or you wake up in the morning and you're like, all right, well, at least I got to work with these guys today. So no matter what happens, at least we're in it together, you know? And so for me, you know, both between the environment I want to provide for those working with me and the goals that we want to achieve together, um, you know, there's, there's nothing more important than, than having the right people working together for a common goal. That's great. You've, you've mentioned the words grit tenacity and humility how do those get woven into into that recipe yeah i think those are some things that are hard to find <laughs> yeah, indeed you know, in indeed, today's world yeah. um, i mean it, it's just interesting you know we we have a lot of really good things happening in our in our industry you know we hear a lot about you know 
mental health and, and awareness. And, and it's, it's really critical. Um, and, and at the same time, I think there's a lot of confusion, you know, to that. And I, and I think, you know, what I've seen happen just repeatedly over and over again is, is this, this craft, this profession sort of saved people in a sense, you know, people who are, you know, maybe they have an addictive personality or whatever it may be, but, you know, being able to see the goals and, and, and have this craft overtake their desire for, for other things, you know, really gives them a purpose, you know, and mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. that that's critical. Um, you know, I think the grit and, and tenacity, I mean, tenacity is a word I use repeatedly here in the, in the restaurant. And I mean, really it's the ability to, to work beyond, you know, the, the level of most, if not even what you thought you could do yourself. And, and I think that comes with a sense of, of just believing in what you're doing, <laughs> you know, like I'm like, absolutely yeah. enough for me to work harder. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to train for the marathon and, you know, nobody, nobody does a marathon without thinking at certain points of why am I doing this? I should just stop. Like, why do I have to go, <laughs> all the way? you know, and, and really there's a reason fewer people on the earth have done marathons than others, you know? And so, um, you know, I think that's something for me, you, you honestly can't really teach, you know, you can put the model in front of people, you can show people the example of what that looks like, but it just, it really comes down to, to the individual. Um, and, and similarly, you know, with the humility side of things, I think that's, you know, something I tell people here, like, I don't, I don't need superstars working for me. I don't need, I just, I just need people who want to be part of the team and are willing to, to, to do whatever it takes. And, you know, hopefully we build some superstars here that come from, from what we do, but ultimately, you know, the, the humility there just, it allows everyone to continue to be in an environment of learning and support. Um, you know, the old school ways of yelling and screaming are, 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 are still there. They're still prevalent. They're still my default mode because that's, that's the world I was trained in as well. And, and so it's, it takes a conscious effort to, you know, sort of take that, that point of, of humility and say, we're all accountable to one another. This isn't a dictatorship. You know, we all are here to learn. And you know, I think I told somebody the other day, like, I don't, I don't want to be the smartest guy in the room. You know, that that's like my worst fear here is, you know, I want to be learning and growing those same three goals still apply to me today. You know, they, they haven't changed, even though I'm no longer a, you know, 17 year old, you know, pimple faced kid going to culinary school, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, those goals hold true. And, and I think that, that, that sense of recognition. And I mean, that's why I love this craft is there's always more to learn. There's always something you don't know and you can learn from anyone. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. So chef, you've, you, you've worked with some of the most, um, well-known esteemed chefs. You're, you're now in that class. You've worked with Roger Verger, Eric Repair, Thomas Keller, the list goes on. And I'm curious as to how their mentorship for you played a role in your culinary journey. And then in, in turn, how you then, uh, and we'll talk about some of the other mentorship um, uh, initiatives that you're involved in, in, in just a bit, but how did they impact you and the style you now have as you lead your, your team? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think at a young age, I remember, you know, one of the first chefs I worked for, he, he was great. I had a, you know, it was at the Williamsburg Inn and um, in Virginia. And I was fortunate to land in a, in a pretty decent place to, to start your culinary career. People had gone to culinary school, were learning, you know, you know, teaching basic, you know, good technique overall. And uh, I also remember there was one guy there I didn't really like, you know, I didn't really like his, <laughs> his management style. And I think I learned two things there. One is, you know, how to kind of emulate what you, what you do like, and then also fill in the blanks of, of what you feel people lack or are missing. And, you know, it's kind of the same, same goal I had when I took over as a coach for Boku store in 2017 was, you know, to, to fill in the gaps that I wish, you know, had been filled in for me and, and how do I support that? So, you know, being able to, and that, and that's the whole goal of that, the way that cycle is built is to build on the year before. Um, but I think in terms of the mentors for me, I mean, I think there's a misconception, you know, especially in our, in our business of, of what a mentor looks like. Um, I think a lot of people are looking for someone who, 
they're going to be my mentor and they're going to be there for me all the time. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to talk every week and have coffee and say, tell me what to do. And, you know, there's, there's just not enough time in the world for, for that on a consistent basis. It is important, you know, for my team that they hear from me on a regular basis. Um, sometimes it's collectively as a group, try to find those individual moments and then for sure finding those individual moments periodically. But a, a lot of that mentorship just comes through, through being together, through working in the trenches together, through, you know, just, just being that, that constant example and giving them something to, to tangibly follow and emulate. And, um, you know, I think the mentorship comes through the collective team as well. You know, Thomas Keller built a team at Per Se that wasn't just him, it was everyone and, and all of those chefs there, Corey Lee, Jonathan Benno, you know, all of these chefs who were there were mentors for me in that. So, you know, it's a, it's the collective team and that's why it's important that anyone working under me is, is emulating, you know, if not better than me, you know, the management style, the, the mentality, the culture that, you know, they understand, you know, if you're a sous chef working for me, you, you are not above the law. <laughs> <laughs> We're very much in line, if not even more so accountable for what we stand for. So, um, you know, I think that's something that, you know, I, I've, I've done throughout, you know, looking at, you know, my time at La Bernadette, my time at Per Se, French Laundry and other places was really what did I love? about working there, what were the things that I, I could take away? And then, you know, some of the things that were like, you know, I understand why it was like that, but I think we can do it differently in some ways. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the, you know, lastly is just, you know, these chefs had a, a, a mentality of creating opportunity, you know, for us. Um, you know, I know Eric Repair was very supportive of me going to Per Se when I left there and, and helping me make that bridge. And, you know, first, for certain with, with Chef Keller, just, you know, creating opportunity and supporting me in those roles that I took on from, from one place to the next. And, um, you know, I mean, I spent a decade working for him in three different restaurants and the Boku store and, you know, never grew tired of, of the opportunity that I had. So, you know, creating opportunity um, is part of that. And, and a big piece comes with, you know, allowing them to, um, you know, to blossom you know, find a, find a place to cultivate that talent and, and keep it working under you and not, and not traveling elsewhere. Sure. Sure. How, chef for you personally, how, how do you recharge? How do you find innovation? Is it, is it through travel, family time, exercise, meditation? Um, I, I imagine you don't have a lot of time, but with all these different projects going on, what, where, where do you find the time to, 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 to bring that inspiration out? Yeah. Well, I'd say the last two years has been pretty hard <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, everything's been so restricted and shut down. You know, I think we found a lot of that just here locally. Um, and again, just couldn't be more thankful that I'm, I, I've been where I have been and, you know, you know, seeing some of the challenges others have gone through, but it hasn't, hasn't been easy here by, at all by any means. But I mean, I think for me, a lot of exercise, you know, when is, is really when I know I'm at my best. Um, and so when I'm not doing that, I know like, I need to, I need to get back to it, but you know, cycling, <laughs> cycling, running, you know, love playing pretty much any sport, you know, soccer's my, my, my favorite. And, um, you know, I, I, I try to make sure, you know, I have three kids. My wife does pastry. We, we met in culinary school. Uh, back oh, wow. Then. That's great. That's great. You know, so I'm, I'm fortunate. She understands, you know, what it takes to, to be in this, in this business, but, um, you know, I make sure that when I'm outside of here, that I spend that time with my family. Um, you know, that that's pretty critical. So, you know, I've, I've sort of found that balance isn't a, two scales at an even level, but, you know, more so, uh, you know, the pendulum swings this way and you got to make sure it swings back. <laughs> um, but definitely travel, you know, is, is where I think I get the most kind of sort of renewed enthusiasm, if you will, being on the receiving side of sure, sure. hospitality experience or, or seeing the innovation of another chef and, and, or just exploring ingredients in another place. Um, just, just kind of renews that excitement and diversity that you get from, from this kind of experience. And so um, I'd say, yeah, the collective, the collective whole there um, is, is really key for, you know, maintaining that balance. And, you know, I know I, I've learned at this point to know when, it, when it's off balance and, and what I need to do to get back to it. Um, so I, I feel really fortunate, you know, I've 
you know, have a family with my wife, super supportive. And I obviously wouldn't be where I am without her. So that, that, that alone is your balance, right? Family. That's, that, that, that's great. I love that response. Mm -hmm. you, you know, chef for, for, let's just say specifically for Escoffier students or any culinary students that have the desire or the dream to work, let's say with chefs at your level, or at least approaching that level, what advice would you give just at the, at the simplest level, um, for them to climb that ladder? Um, I, obviously we've talked a lot of, a lot about grit and humility, tenacity, teamwork, hard work, um, anything specific for, for young culinarians to keep in mind, not, e not even competition, but just to get to a place of cuisine like you're working with now? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, first of all, like, you know, step one is just, just knocking on the door, you know? I mean, where we are today, I mean, we hire, we hire anyone here at Press, you know, we've, I think developed a place that's an environment of learning for whatever skill set you're at, whether that's, you know, I've, I've hired my friend's 17 year old son who's never worked in a kitchen before and, you know, is in the, in the Marines coming back, you know, in two months. And, um, you know, we've hired some, some good talented cooks and everything in between. And, and, you know, we're right down the street from culinary school here. And, you know, we have the opportunity to have eight or nine students working here at any one time. So, you know, I think never, never underestimate, you know, I think your ability to contribute, if you're willing to, to listen, follow instruction and work hard, like you can work anywhere. That's it, you know, in, in my opinion. And so I, I think ultimately though, um, you know, two, two key things, you know, I used to work for one of my, you know, mentors as a, as a chef at, at the culinary school at CIA in New York, you know, William Phillips was uh, kind of, my mentor for over a year. And, you know, he always used to say, I'd rather work at the, at the bottom of the top than at the top of the bottom, you know, oh, yeah. yeah. and really just saying, you know, it's you, a lot of kids would leave school, go to be a sous chef. And I'm like, you, you just jumped over the great divide here. <laughs> that money might be there. That position might be there, but your ability to grow beyond that has now been severely limited, you know, and sure. I think, I think understanding that just having the patience, to get in at the bottom, to work your way up and, and ultimately really to in, enjoy that journey. You know, one of my favorite parts of my career was, was working for free for six months in France for, you know, like I just worked, I, I basically went there and was like, I don't have any money. I need to work six days. <laughs> like, no problem. So, you know, I mean, it was, if you love what you do, then, I mean, this, this is, you know, such a wonderful, wonderful career. And, you know, I, I used to tell the young kids coming to French Laundry, I'm like, you're either going to love this job or it's going to be the worst job you've ever had. And it's totally, <laughs> up to you. you know, and it's, it's, if you want that discipline, if you want that level of, of, of push and challenge, you know, like, and you thrive on that, like you're in the right place. You know, if you, you know, just kind of want to learn and, you know, get to the next thing and, you know, check the box, put in your resume, like it's, it's only going to get you, you so far, you know, and I, yeah, I yeah. Do, do it while you're young, do it while you can, because, you know, life only gets more complicated as you go along. So I think that was, you know, some of the key decisions I made was just, just making those sacrifices when I was young, when, you know, not having a paycheck didn't really matter. And, you know, I was just worked for free, had a free place to live, ate staff meal, ate some cheese on my days off. <laughs> it was great. I loved it. I'll do it all over again. <laughs> That's great storytelling. I love it. Um, giving back is really important to you as, as a mentor, but also to the community. Um, a, a few words about your involvement with uh, the Mentor Foundation and No Kid Hungry. Um, really important to you, huh? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you've been given an opportunity to, like I have, I think you you immediately look at like, how do you, how do you translate that to the, to the next? And I mean, I think there's a point in every chef's career where, you know, at one point it's all about your achievements and what you're doing. And at some point, you know, alongside that becomes the opportunity you have to create that opportunity for others. And so, you know, some of, some of our reward in a sense comes from seeing those, those young chefs go on and, and do their thing. Um, and, uh, you know, knowing that you had a, a role in, in that success. And so, um, 
you know, I think for me, Mentor has been, you know, a huge part of Boku Store. They're the organization behind Boku Store USA and their Young Chefs competitions and scholarship program really is 100% focused on, on exactly this. Um, and, you know, I think with other things we've done, I think most recently, really, the, the key thing is just that local community. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Through the pandemic here, we started a program called, uh, you know, Feed Our Families with the Boys and Girls Club here. And I mean, I think collectively, we did about 30,000 meals over the course of the year uh, at the height of the pandemic. And, and, you know, just seeing the impact of that, you know, in the community, on those involved in, in executing that, you know, it's just been really extraordinary. And uh, just again, goes to show kind of the opportunity we have to have an impact as, as an industry, you know, as, as chefs. And, you know, you look at, uh, you know, what Jose Andreas does across the world with, with his program and others. And I think it's, it's a constant reminder that, you know, it's not, if we make it just about us, we'll, we'll achieve an award. You'll get that recognition and, and it'll eventually disappear. You know, I mean, I mean, the, the accolades come and go and people forget and people move on. <laughs> sure. sure. And especially in today's world, it's the, it's the, it's the news of today that matters. And, and I think when you look at the impact you can have on a community um, and on the impact you can have on individuals, you know, that that's something that actually lives on, you know, and that continues forward. So um, I think balancing the investment of our time and attention on, on both of these is really critical. Well said, well said, and thank you for that work. Chef, we're, we're getting a little close to the end of our time today. The name of the podcast is The Ultimate Dish. So here comes the toughest question. What is, Chef, <laughs> the ultimate dish in your world? Yeah, I think, I think the general answer to that would be, you know, a, a dish that gives you a real sense of place. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a sense of, of, of a moment, not only a sense of place, but of, of a moment in time. Um, you know, and I think uh, there is a specific meal for me just going to um, Bistro Maxime's in Paris and just walking through the door, <laughs> smelling pork fat and truffles. <laughs> it was just, I knew you were going to go to France. It's something I, I never, I, I never forget. And, and I mean, that was, that was a memorable meal, maybe heightened by the fact we had, we had just done really well in the Boku store. I don't know, yeah. but um, you know, it was, I, I think that, you know, that experience, you know, and, and there's multiple stories like that. Sure. Sure. But, um, you know, just, just having that sense of, place moment in time it's winter it's cold that warm feeling when you walk through the doors and just uh yeah it's 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 a beautiful thing i love that i love that chef thank you so much congratulations on all this success we're honored to have had this time with you today um best of luck going forward and uh, i hope we can send some escoffier students your way soon yeah let us know we're here thank you so much <laughs> appreciate you having me Thank you, Chef. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.